Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history and I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. Among the world's elite fighting forces, perhaps none holds more mystique than the famed French Foreign Legion. Immortalized in novelist P.C. Wren's Beau Jass, an adventure novel about life in the Legion that has spawned four famous film adaptations, the famed Les Gens Autangers is seen as a place where cutthroats and refugees can earn a new life and French citizenship through military service. But the French Foreign Legion was not always the elite force that we know today, and in fact it was nearly disbanded in the 19th century when one battle changed everything and established a reputation and a legend that is still revered today. The story of the famous piece of wood that is the heart of one of the world's most elite fighting forces is little known outside of France, but the epic tale of Jean d'Anjou and the Battle of Cameron is a tale of extraordinary bravery in the face of overwhelming odds, and it deserves to be remembered. In 1830, Charles X, the last of the French monarchs of the House of Bourbon, was forced to abdicate after what was called the July Revolution, and was replaced by his cousin, Louis-Philippe, the Duke of Orleans. One of the results of the revolution was that France saw an influx of immigrants. Some of those were idealists, coming to France because they shared the liberal ideas of the French Revolution, and others were former soldiers of Napoleon. In 1831, King Louis-Philippe decreed the formation of the French Foreign Legion to be made up of foreign volunteers. The creation of the force served two purposes. First, it helped to remove the domestic threat of immigrants who could be disruptive to the government. And second, it provided additional military support for French colonial endeavors, especially the French conquest of Algeria, which had become bogged down and was becoming increasingly unpopular at home. As the goal was to remove disruptive elements, the Legion allowed men to join anonymously, and any information offered was taken at face value. That provision ended up allowing French citizens, technically ineligible for the Legion, to join. They were mostly petty criminals or men running from their past. As you can imagine, a force made up of foreigners and petty criminals that by law was not allowed to operate inside of metropolitan France was not particularly attractive to regular officers and not highly regarded by the regular army. The early legion was rife with discipline issues, desertion, and suffered from a lack of good officers and non-commissioned officers. The legion was used for undesirable deployments, for example supporting the regency against the Carlists in the Spanish Civil War in 1833, a war in which the legion was almost completely decimated by lengthy combat operations and almost complete lack of support from both France and Spain. Ironically, it was the Carlist defeat that reinvigorated the legion as many former Spanish rebels fled to France and into the French Foreign Legion. The headquarters was in Algeria, where the fighting continued until 1847. In 1848, Louis-Philippe was overthrown and replaced by the first popularly elected French head of state, Louis-Napoleon, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Louis-Napoleon was a reformer at home, but also known for military adventurism abroad. Over the next decade, the Legion was sent on more undesirable foreign deployments, including the cholera-stricken war in the Crimea and the bloody Second Italian War of Independence. Even though they proved themselves in combat many times and had been expanded into a larger force, they were still poorly regarded within the French military. In 1861, Louis Napoleon invaded Mexico in the War of the French Intervention. Ostensibly fought over Mexican war debts and free trade, the war was actually a last attempt at European domination of Mexico, with Louis Napoleon's aim to install a European monarch who could lead a reliable Catholic counterbalance to the United States. The Legion was sent to join the war in Mexico in March of 1863. Among the Legionnaires was Captain Jean d'Anjou. D'Anjou had attended a prestigious military academy and joined the French army in 1848. In 1852, he had transferred to the Foreign Legion, where he was a veteran of the wars in Algeria, the Crimea, Morocco, and Sardinia. In 1853, he had lost his left hand when his musket exploded, and he had had a wooden prosthetic made. In Mexico, he was a member of the headquarters staff of Colonel Pierre Jean Ingro, the commander of the Foreign Legion in Mexico. In Mexico, the Legion had characteristically been given the worst duty assignments, protecting supply convoys that came up the coast. The commander of the French forces in Mexico, General Frederick Faure, said, I prefer to leave the foreigners, rather than Frenchmen, to guard the most unhealthy area, where malaria reigned. The Legion was assigned to man local guard posts, and tropical diseases like malaria and yellow fever decimated their ranks. In 1862, the French had tried to take the Mexican fortress in the city of Puebla by assault. They had been defeated with heavy losses in a battle that demonstrated that the war would not be easily won. The Mexican victory at the Battle of Puebla, May 5th of 1862, is still celebrated today as Cinco de Mayo. As a response, in 1863, the French had laid siege to the fortress, a key strong point blocking the French forces from taking the capital in Mexico City. But the siege had bogged down in the face of fierce Mexican resistance. General Ferre had sent to have a supply train brought up with huge siege cannons and the army's pay, nearly 4 million francs, from the port of Veracruz. 
That convoy would obviously be the target of Mexican guerrillas, and the responsibility for protecting the convoy fell to the French Foreign Legion. The convoy was being escorted by two companies of the Legion. On April 29th, a spy informed Colonel Jean Ingro that a substantial Mexican force had been dispatched to attack the convoy. The colonel decided to send another company on a patrol to reinforce the convoy. The company chosen, the 3rd Company of the 1st Battalion, had a nominal strength of 120, but due to illness had only 62 legionnaires fit for duty. As all the company officers were disabled due to illness, Captain Danjou volunteered to lead the patrol, accompanied by two lieutenants from the headquarters company. The company left at 1 a.m. the morning of April 30th, preferring to march at night to avoid the heat of the day. By 7 a.m. they had arrived at the village of Palo Verde, the extent of their patrol, without encountering any enemy. Tired from their march, they paused for breakfast. Around 8 a.m. the sentry spied a dust cloud that indicated a cavalry formation. The small patrol of just 60 men had just run into approximately 600 Mexican cavalry. Danjou tried to lead his group back to an abandoned walled hacienda called Cameroon, about a half mile away, but the cavalry caught them before they could get to the safety of the buildings. Caught in the open by ten times their number in cavalry, Danjou ordered the legionnaires to form a square, a tight formation with two ranks, one standing and one kneeling. The cavalry charged. At 50 meters, Danjou gave the order to fire, killing many of the cavalrymen and blunting their attack. Knowing they could not defend themselves in the open, Danjou ordered the company to make for the hacienda. They fixed bayonets and charged. Several of the company were killed or captured in the running fight to the walls, but Danjou and 46 legionnaires made it to the hacienda, now defending little more than a farmhouse courtyard made of stone walls. A Mexican officer came to Danjou under a white flag and offered the opportunity to surrender. Danjou refused, saying that his men had plenty of ammunition and would fight. Danjou went to each of his men, asking them to pledge to die rather than be captured. Without hope of holding out until rescue, Danjou intended to distract as many enemy as he could from attacking the convoy. The Mexican army threw wave after wave of attack against the hacienda, but the legionnaires defended the walls fiercely. Their supply mules had been lost at the start of the battle, and they had little water or food in the oppressive heat. Around noon, Captain Danjou was struck in the chest by a Mexican bullet. He died a few minutes later. Two battalions of Mexican infantry arrived, bringing the Mexican force up to nearly 2,000. The Mexicans continued to press the attack, trying to hack holes in the walls. By 6 p.m., only Lieutenant Modet and four legionnaires remained, and they were down to their last bullets. They fired and charged with their bayonets. A Mexican volley killed one legionnaire and wounded Lieutenant Modet. Surrounded, a Mexican colonel demanded that the last three legionnaires surrendered. They replied, only if they were allowed to keep their arms and that their wounded be treated. Astounded by their bravery, the colonel agreed, saying, one refuses nothing to men such as you. It is a peculiarity of war that soldiers who are willing to fight their enemy to the death still respect that enemy in battle. There was no just cause for the war of the French intervention. These legionnaires were invaders, and yet the Mexican army respected their brave last stand. When presented with the last three legionnaires from the battle, the Mexican commander, Colonel Francisco Milan, said in amazement, These are not men. They are demons. In the nearly 10-hour battle, the 62 men of the 3rd Company had caused nearly 600 Mexican casualties, killed or wounded. True to their word, the Mexicans treated the French wounded, although Lieutenant Modet did die later of his wounds. In all, 24 members of the 3rd Company survived the battle, virtually all of those wounded, and most returned to France in July of that year in a prisoner exchange. Alerted to Milan's presence, the convoy stopped until they could reinforce their guard and did eventually reach their destination. The Mexicans who were besieged in the Battle of Puebla surrendered in May of 1863, but the war raged on for another three years before faced with increasing unpopularity with the war at home and pressure from the United States, Louis Napoleon was compelled to withdraw Mexican forces in 1866. Maximilian's remaining forces were defeated in 1867, and Maximilian himself was captured and executed in May of 1867, ending the war. The Battle of Cameroon is seen as a defining moment in the history of the French Foreign Legion. It is considered the event that earned them a permanent and respected place in the French military. Legionnaires served with great distinction in both world wars, suffered greatly in the defeat at Dien Bien Phu in the First Indochina War, and continue to serve today in the global war on terror. The French Foreign Legion, which is still the only unit of the French military that accepts foreign recruits, is today numbered among the world's most elite fighting forces. Jean d'Anjou's hand was recovered by a local farmer and reacquired by the Legion. Some stories say it was recovered by a Belgian ally, and some say that a former Legionnaire bought it from the farmer. It is kept at the Legion headquarters in Abagne, France, and taken out for a parade every April 30th, Cameroon Day. His hand is the most cherished artifact of the Legion. It represents not just a brave battle, but a defining moment where the legend of the French Foreign Legion was born. It is the link between the Legion of today and its storied past. It deserves to be remembered. Mm -hmm.
I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I'll be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe 